yes, it is definitely something about the name Jesus. Amen. Um, I was out when I was in LA, me and my mom were talking and she was talking about how sometimes when she used to go to sleep, you could feel something like she could feel something holding her down and she can't talk like her mouth. Was like, and I said, that's happened to me numerous of times as well. And we both simultaneously said, only time that you can come out of that is when you scream Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you try to say anything else while this, whatever this is that holds you down while you sleep, nothing, you can't say nothing. But when you say Jesus, yep, it, like it lets right you up. go every yep. time. It's the, and that lets you know right there that it is something about the name Jesus. Power. I have been dreaming and saying, oh my God, this is a dream. Why I can't wake up? Why am I stuck in this dream? I want to get up. I want to wake up. And then my spirit will remind me, call on the name of Jesus. As soon as I say Jesus, well, I'll wake straight up out of my sleep. Oh, man. So that lets you know it's definitely something about the name Jesus. The Bible also declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee, every knee, not just the Christian knee, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Um. I just came across a little something very. I just wanted to read. Go, go, um, go, go, come on, babe, go. babe, come on. Sorry. Come on. <laughs> Sit down. Um, I just wanted to read something um, yes. that I was that I came across as I was walking my dog. I said, you know what? I'm gonna read about this. I'm gonna talk about this. We. I'm trying to get out of here, y'all. I'm trying to get out of this season of what the Lord is having me talk about. Um, but I cannot be disobedient to the voice of God. If God tells me to talk about something. I have to talk about it. I know sometimes it might offend people. Sometimes people don't want to hear that. Um, you know, sometimes God has me as a motivational speaker, Christian, or sometimes he wants me to tell the truth about the word of God. And, you know, this is where I'm at right now. It's just, I found some interesting jewels in the book of Jude. I want to ask before I read this, how many people read the book of Jude? Like, this is a book that is overlooked a lot. Like a lot of us, we really don't, um, pay attention to the book of Jude, maybe because it's only one chapter, one powerful chapter, though, this, this one chapter in the Bible, very powerful, I've read it numerous of times, um, and I, I always be like, oh, that's good, but I just leave the stuff alone, because, you know, it gets so controversial with uh, what's going on in today's world, and what's going on in the churches of today, um, but Jude is a very powerful book, in the Bible, I would encourage everybody that has a Bible that reads their Bible, go to Jude. It's the book before Revelations. It's the book before the last book of the Bible. And it's only one chapter, one powerful chapter. It says a lot. Um, God knew exactly what he was doing with, with making Jude one chapter. Because if it would have went any further, people probably wouldn't pick the Bible up no more. They'd be scared to read it. Oh, that book, yeah, I don't want to read the Bible. You know, do that kind of stuff. But Jude is very, um, very... It's a powerful book. So I'm just going to read and elaborate and read and elaborate, read and elaborate and try to get out of here. My phone is dying. So if it dies on me, y'all forgive me. I got it on the charger. I switched uh, batteries and I switched chargers. So hopefully this works. Give us a little leeway. But let's get into this. Jude chapter one. Jude chapter one. I'm going to try to read the cha whole chapter in its entirety. But if I don't I'll try to get the good stuff um, out. This says, greetings from Jude. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy and peace. So Jude is writing this letter to the ones that are called by God, you know, the ones that are out here ministering, um, outreach, you know, when you're called by God, you don't necessarily have to be a preacher all the time. You can be, it could be something about your spirit. That's just loving that, that some people don't have to preach and they could just come on the scene and you could feel the spirit of love on them so much that it just breaks you down. Like any negative person that comes around this loving person, all that negativity goes away and they don't even have to preach a scripture. All they have to do is operate in the love of Christ. So, you know, God, how you doing, sis? God bless you, sister queen. Um, they just have to operate in the love of Christ. You know, everybody is not going to be um, a preacher, preacher, 
like that. Some of us just know some good word to give to people to help them, encourage them. And some of us are have the spirit of giving. Some of us have the spirit of love, you know, interpreting tongues, heal, they can heal, all type of different things. But this book is addressing those that are called by God. Watch this. This is where it gets good. In verse three, it says, this is the dangers of false teaching. Watch this. It says, the dangers of false teachers. Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. Look, he was, he was starting off about to write about how good the salvation in Jesus Christ is. This is like me writing a letter to Monique about to tell her, hey man, ain't God good? Man, I just want to share this. And then here comes something to deter it. So he says, I was about to write you this letter uh, to share the, the about this letter, I mean, about the salvation we all share. But now I have, now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith of God that entrust that had to end. <sighs> Hold on, y'all. Let me read that again. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. So basically, he's a, thank you, sis. He's basically telling you, hey, I was about to write, a, write about how good the salvation in Jesus Christ is, but I have to write to you to stand on the word of God, defend the faith. Oh, my God, this phone is going to die. To, hold on, hold on, you guys. I'm burning my battery out. All right, so initially he was writing this to just encourage the saints and talk about the salvation of Jesus Christ. But then he had to switch it up and say, you know what? No, I have to write this to you. This is very important. Thank you, sis. I have to write this to you. This is very important. So he says, um, I say this. He said, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their ways into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. I'm going to read that again. He said, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. I'm going to park right there real quick. If the, let me tell you what the definition of immoral is, because some people might not know. Because at first I didn't know if I didn't know what immoral was. I just was like, it sound bad. I was one of those type of people. It just sound bad. But the definition of immoral is broadly conflicting with generally or traditionally held moral principles. So this basically means whatever is supposed to be done, whatever is right, living against that. So. To live immorally in the Bible, you're going, it means to go against what God said, do. So if God said, don't sin, don't lie, don't kill, to live immoral means, to live immorally means you do those things. So it's telling us, it says, be careful because some have wormed their way. When it, when it says worm, that means snuck is like weasel, you know, like they didn't just bogart their way into the church. They stealthily snuck into the church, meaning they played it off like, oh, yes, glory to God, doing all that old good stuff until they got into a place where they can say something. And then when they got the opportunity to say something, what they were doing in the church is okaying immoral way of, is okaying an immoral way to live by trying to hide it under God's grace. So, this, this, there's a lot of people out there that's teaching this, that we're saved by grace and mercy, not by works. So when people hear grace and mercy, they think, oh, I can do whatever I want to do because God has grace on my life. So I asked God, I said, God, well, what is this grace thing? And I heard the Lord tell me just like this. He said, grace is for those that didn't know. So imagine you were living a certain way and didn't know that it was wrong. God could have allowed your life to be snuffed from you in your sin, but he didn't. That's where grace comes in at. God could have allowed you to overdose on drugs, but he didn't because he knew he was going to use you for a purpose. That's where grace comes in. Grace, we, we all still fall under grace. Don't get me wrong. We all still fall under grace, but... This grace is for those that did not know any better and came to know Christ. So they look back over their lives and say, oh my God, I could have died in my sin and went to hell. I could have died um, while I was living a certain way, but God had grace on my life to allow me to get where I am today. Now that I know God, 
I repent of my sins and turn away from them. So he, the, the scripture is saying, I'm telling this because some because some ungodly people have wormed their ways into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. So basically this is saying, he's reminding the, he's reminding the saints, he's saying, okay, remember Jesus saved the Israel, the children of Israel from the Egyptians, but those that did not listen ended up getting destroyed. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around it, things like that. I'm going to read on. So he's basically telling them, um, don't think because you're saved and you're doing things wrong on purpose that grace comes in. No, grace is for, say for instance, you are struggling with something like, man, I really don't want to cuss this person out, but they keep on bothering me. And then you snap and cuss them out. The Lord knows you didn't want to do it, but the person kept, uh, I'm just trying to kill, bro, but you just keep on, uh, they just kept on bothering him, so he ended up snapping and cursing that person out. Now, when you say, Lord, I'm sorry, he knows your heart, that grace covers that. But if you like, I'm covered in grace, I know I'm covered in grace by God, so I'm going to go cuss this MNF. It don't work like that. You can't, you can't confess that you know that God's grace is on your life and then you go do something wrong to somebody. That's not how it works. So he's telling us in this scripture, Jesus saved the Israelites from Egypt, but the ones that didn't listen after being saved from Egypt, he destroyed them. The same thing will happen to us. So he said, be careful. These people coming into the church is telling you, live how you want to live. It's your life. Do you, boo-boo. You covered in grace. Watch out for those. The, the Judas telling they worm their way into the churches telling you basically no matter what you do, you covered in God's marvelous grace. That's not true. The Lord wants us to turn away from our sins. The grace is because we didn't know and he didn't allow anything to happen to us while we were yet in our sins. But once we came to Christ, and we acknowledged what we were doing is wrong, repent and turn away from it. We're covered. Now we gonna make mistakes. The Bible says all sin and fall short of the glory of God. God knows this, but he knows that we are not intentionally going to do anything and said, I'm coming in grace. I'm going to go shoot this cat right quick. I'm going to kill him. Then I'm going to come repent and say, Lord, I'm covered in grace. It don't work like that. Now, if you're caught in the moment and you're not thinking and you do something wrong, grace covers it. Oh, Lord, I wasn't in my right mind. You know, I did not intentionally go to do that, but I slipped up and made a mistake. Lord, forgive me. Grace. Boom. Mercy. Boom. Not doing what you want to do. You know, he's telling you, they, they weaseled them ways into their, they weaseled, snaked, snuck, wormed their way into the church and told this lie. They, it says the dangers of false teachings. They're telling these lies, telling you it's okay to sleep with whoever you want to sleep with and not be married. That is not true. You know, it's a, and then at the definition says uh, of, of immoral, says general, uh, conflicting with general or traditionally held morals and principles. A lot of people saying they're not getting married in these days. That's going against morals and tradition. I mean, that's going against um, yeah, the tradition. God told us that man is to marry woman and become one. The world said you don't have to get married. So now the world is following that rule. That does not change what God said. And now there's people in churches preaching it. Yeah, you might not you might not want to be married because the last time you got married, it didn't work out for you. So God understands you fall under grace and mercy. You don't have to be married to that man that you're sleeping with. That's a lie. That is a lie. God, the Bible tells us husbands love your wife like Christ loved the church. That scripture applies to married people. So um, if you got a woman and you're not married to her, that her love your wife like Christ loved the church thing does not apply because you ain't even married. You sinning. But a lot of people will try to use it. I'm loving her like Christ loved the church. I know we're not married, but I still love her like that. We can't have step with God. We can't do this lukewarm stuff. This, this is a lukewarm uh, mentality. I don't want to get married. Why you don't want to get married? You love God. You should be wanting to get married. Why you don't want to get married? Because in the back of your mind, it might be somebody else you might want to be with. Or you don't, I don't want to be stuck to one person for the rest of my life. Why not? Jesus didn't say that to us. 
Jesus didn't say, I don't want to be stuck to this person for the rest of my life. He wants to be stuck with us for the rest of our lives. We should want to be stuck with our wives or our husbands for the rest of our lives. Amen. I know that's a little cyber, but I had to just drop that in there. I'm trying to move a little faster. My phone thing is not going up. Okay, it says, um, it says, it says, I say this because, I'm going to read that again. I say this because ungodly people have wormed their ways into the churches saying that God, God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. That condemnation, that condem, come on, man. That condemnation, I lost track. Hold on, y'all. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago for they denied, for they have denied our master and Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not listen or those that did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay with stay within the limits of the authority God, the authority God gave them but left the place where they belong God has kept them securely chained in a prison of darkness awaiting the great day of judgment this is talking about the angels there's these angels went against God and did not stay in the order of what God told them to stay in. So what did God do? He chained them away in darkness and he's going to, until the day of judgment for them not listening. So where's the grace there? The grace, he, God already gave them grace and they went against God's grace. And what did he do? He chained them into a dark place until the day of judgment. So the, the scripture is telling us, be careful of these people that are telling you no matter what you do, God still loves you. He does, but he wants you to turn away from it. That's where the grace is. He's giving you grace to turn away from it, not grace to keep you keep on doing it. I'm sorry, God. Okay, it's cool. Uh, oh, I did it again. I'm sorry, God. Okay, it's cool. I uh, did it again. I'm sorry, God. Okay, it's cool. That's not what the grace is. The grace is you could have died in that, but I gave you grace. Repent, turn away. Repent, turn away, not repent, go back. That's what this, the scripture tells us, Jude is a powerful one chapter. It's, a power, it's telling us, he's saying, this is a false teaching that they're teaching. They're teaching people, no matter what you do, God is going to show grace on your life. He's showing the grace because you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. Once you come to knowledge of knowing that it is wrong, he says, repent and turn away. All of that, up until that point, you had grace. You still get grace after, but it's when you lose control, unable to um, unable to control how you feel about a certain situation. So you might slide out, cuss somebody out, end up getting in a fight, making a mistake you really regret making. God gives you grace because he knows your heart. He knows your heart. So if in your heart you like, God already going to give me grace anyway, so I'm going to do it anyway. He knows that. He's saying you made the decision in your heart to go against me knowingly. And you expect me to show grace? You knew you was you knew you're not supposed to do that. You have control. That's why the Bible also tells us when uh, we're tempted, God will create an escape for us to not fall into the temptation. Do, it's just based on do we want that escape route? You know, but sometimes we I don't like that escape route, so I'm gonna just fall for the temptation and tell God I'm sorry. To do that. You're smacking God in his face. You're taking advantage of his grace. You're taking advantage of his mercy. So um, let's carry on because uh, I need this thing to charge. Um, it says in six, it says, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of, of, of authority. God gave them, but left the place, but left the place where they belong. God has kept them securely chained in a prison of darkness awaiting I mean, waiting for the great day of judgment, meaning they'll be out to be judged later on. But right now they locked up. Where's the grace? They in there like, Lord, okay, okay, okay. Can't be wild about your ass, Jesus. Nah, you got to stay right there until Judgment Day. And don't forget, here it goes, and don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immoralities and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and served as a warning of the fire of God's judgment. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And listen. See, if you listen to the words, it says as a warning to let everybody know if you do this again, 
you're going to get destroyed and burned in hell. He's telling you right here in the scripture. He, say, he says, and don't, let me read it again. He says, he says, and don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and served as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. In the same way, these people who claim authority over their dreams live, or more, live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural things. Okay, so what that scripture basically is saying is these people have in their dreams, figured out something about their self and the power that they think they have, and they scoff and look down on supernatural things that God did. So you see this going on today. People today are saying, oh, man, I don't believe that God parted no Red Sea. I don't know. I don't believe that angels came down. And they're, they're scoffing at the supernatural things that God did. Jesus didn't walk on no water. I wasn't there, so I don't believe, you know, doing that kind of thing. But believe that they have power themselves. They don't believe in what God did in, back in them days and in the biblical times, but they believe that they can see into the future. They can read into your life. They can uh, heal, call, do all kind of healings and all these different things without God. It's saying it right here. It says, in the same way these people who claim authority over, from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority and Defy authority. I don't want to fall under what God said. I don't want to listen to that. It's my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what the Bible said. That book was wrote by man. Defying authority. God is real. For those that know, no, we know. You know, it's a saying that say, if you know, then you know. It's very true. A lot of these people don't get to get this um, <clears throat> revelation from God because they will not surrender. They will not surrender and believe. So God is saying, I don't have to show you nothing because you don't even, you don't even want me to show you. You don't even want me. You're not even crying out to me saying, God, if you real, show me. I'm pretty sure 90% of us in here that believe in God all said that. God, if you real, show me. And it was in that moment, <laughs> like, oh, wow, that had to be God. We start finding ourselves saying, that had to be God. Whoa, that had to be God. Oh, that had to be God. Next thing you know, we walk in, in the glory of the Lord because we asked him to show us he was real. He showed us he was real, and we didn't deny it. The enemy always try to bring up coincidence. Maybe that was a coincidence. Don't fall for that. Just keep on going in God because the devil is very crafty. He knows how to articulate and make you think certain godly things or supernatural things that happened in your life that let you know it's God. He tries to make you think it was a coincidence or just the right place at the right time. You know, that kind of stuff. Don't worry about that. It was God. The safest thing to do is to give the credit to God. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So it says, um, Watch this. It says, but even Michael, one of the mightiest of angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, look, in this script, in that verse, basically, Michael knew that the devil is doing what he's supposed to be doing. God has created the devil to do this. I always say this. God created the devil to run God's people back to God. If you notice, you instead of trying to fight the devil without God, you'll run into the arms of God and let the Lord fight for you. God created Lucifer to run you back into the arms of God, not to run you away from God. You Lucifer is taking this up. Lucifer takes this opportunity to deceive you away from God. Instead of when you see the devil doing stuff, run to God. Don't try to figure it out. No, run straight to the arms of God. Because what the enemy is trying to do is deceive you out of the hands and the arms of God. So Michael even knew not to say that the devil, not to call the devil blasphemy. He just rebuked them. That's what we do. That's what we do. We don't sit there and get caught up on the devil disrespecting God. He doing his job. We just say to the Lord, rebuke you. That's what our job. When you see the devil doing stuff, rebuke him. Even Jesus did it. Get thee behind me, Satan. He rebuked Peter. He rebuked everybody that had something, some kind of, you know, something going on with them and Satan was involved. Jesus rebuked the devil. That's all we, we got to rebuke him and go back into the arms of God. Even Michael. Watch. Michael is going to talk about this argument Michael and the devil had over Moses' body. And it says, one of the mightiest angels did not 
<coughs> sorry, <coughs> did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. You heard that? These people scoff at things they do not understand. So when you telling people stories about the Bible and they uh, and they doing all of that, just they don't understand. You thank God that you have the understanding, that you have the knowledge, that you have that ear, that you can hear the voice of God, that you are close to God. Because I said this in my last sermon, the interact your own risk sermon. These people don't understand because God created. The God created everything for the good. God created everything good and everything evil for the day of judgment. We have to stop wrestling and fighting with non-believers. The ones that believe, if they believe a little bit, help them believe more. The ones that, that reject Jesus, what did he say? Do dust the very dust off your shoes and keep going and take your peace with you. We keep trying to force God down the throats of people that don't want him. You're causing more you're causing more stress on yourself. You got the only way they're gonna receive God if they don't know him and they don't want him, you it's your life. The Bible says, let your life be um an epistle to be read of men. We are epistles to be read of men. So if we're living our life the way the Bible says, the way that God has called us to do so, the onlookers that don't believe, they're going to come to you asking questions. God has throughout your relationship. With God, you will have the answers that need that are needed for those questions. If not, God will pull you off of that. The Holy Spirit will unction you to say what needs to be said. If the Holy Spirit doesn't unction you to say anything, don't say anything. Sometimes we feel like we have to say something to everybody. We have to give some type of word to everybody. That's not necessarily true. Talk to those, because the ones that are called by God, the ones that are assigned to you, um, that everything will work according to the Holy Spirit. But if you trying to talk to people that were not appointed or assigned to you, it's not going to work. You're going to find yourself arguing with people. You're going to find yourself bumping heads and you'll find yourself feeling, um, <laughs> it's okay, queen. You'll find yourself feeling all bad and all uncomfortable after talking to these types. The Lord wants us to focus on those that want him. The ones that don't want them, we have to just focus on the ones that do. If the ones that don't want them, uh, don't want them come around, we'll be there to get what they need. The man is not permanent. But when you catch a man, when you catch a person in a um, in a stage and a state in his life where he's not receiving God, you just gotta drop what you drop out the biblical and go. Don't sit there trying to make this person uh, or keep trying to prove to him that God is real. He should see it in your life. Amen. So. They're going to scoff. They're going to scoff at these things. Every time you mention God, oh, here we go. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Just keep on living your life for the Lord. Amen. Because if it's meant for them, they already, God already knew they was chosen before they did. So they'll come to you or something. The Holy Spirit will do something at the right time to reach that person. Amen. And this doesn't, this, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying don't go out and minister. Yes, go out and minister. But if, the, if they don't receive it, just don't feel bad. Go. If they, if they, if you say, do you believe in Jesus? And they say, no, you don't have to say, why? Hold on. Can y'all hear me? Um, anyways, if you say, if, they, if you ask somebody, do they believe in Jesus? And, and you, they say, no, you don't have to ask them why. Just go on about, just, okay, God bless you. Go on about your life. God is not mad at you. You know, God is not saying, oh, so you just go walk off from that person. He's not mad at you for that. You you asked him, do we believe? They said no. Jesus said, if they don't receive me, dust the very dust off your shoes and leave. That's what you do. Get up out of there. All right, you don't want to receive him. All right, God bless you. Go on about your business. Amen. So it says, let me keep going. I got to go because this is, um, uh, my battery's still dying. It says, but these people scoffed at things they understand like Unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. Want me to read that again? It says, like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instinct tells them to do, and so they bring about their own destruction.
if I'm, they know I be, now people know I be doing this and they still want to call. Thank you, mom, for that. So they bring about their own destruction. You got, God sent you in their path to warn them. They didn't receive the warning. Because this is what we don't understand. You don't know what people in private, what they're dealing with with God. God is saying stuff to people in private and they just blatantly not listening. God will tell them, hey, I'm calling, I'm calling, for, I'm, hey, I'm knocking at the door. Come on, receive me, receive me. And then they won't listen and then God will send a messenger or will send a confirmation person their way. And they'll, I don't want that. You're blatantly bringing your own destruction upon you. This is why God is tugging at people. Why, why I feel like God want me to do. I went through this before I started ministering on this app. I, everybody that knows me to a year and a half ago, two years ago, I, they all heard me say this. I feel like God want me to preach. I feel like God want me to minister. I felt it deep down in my soul, felt it deep down in my body, and I moved on it instead of moving away from it. And later on after God showed me that, he said, he said, when I do this, I'm warning people because the enemy is trying to snuff them out. The enemy is trying to take them out. See, when you're walking in the will of God, if you stop walking in the will of God or get outside of the will of God, you're fair game for the devil to kill, steal, and destroy. So when God is tugging at you, if you got a feeling God wants you to do something, go. Even if you don't do it that day, be lined up and geared up and in position for God to get you ready for what it is. But don't reject God's call because now you're outside of his will and the devil is sitting there like, yes. You know, so my mom used to always tell me this when I was young. It's warning before destruction. That's what this is. God is calling out to you. Hey, get over here. The devil is about to try to kill, steal, or destroy you or something in your life. Get over here. Come over. And we be rejecting like, oh, man, that gospel, that Bible, that stuff was written by man and end up snuffed. End up getting snatched up out of the world. End up getting snatched up out of life and, and, and it is life as you know it because you heard God calling you and you said I don't want that and God said all right well I don't put my warning out I done sent my people to conf confirm it and you said no I mean now you left in the hands of the enemy there's a scripture that says when you have an ought or a problem with your brother you uh go to them personally and if they don't if they don't um if you can't fix the problem Going to, just going to them personally, take it to the elders of the church. If you can't fix the problem when you take it to the elders of the church, leave them to the devil. Exactly what the scripture says. I, ooh, somebody find it and put it in the comments. I will read it if you want me to. But when I read that scripture at first, I was like, wow, so leave them to the devil. But I get why now because you'll find yourself wasting your time trying to get somebody to do something that they're never going to do. That's a waste of your time. You can sit there preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching to these people if they don't want God. You're wasting your time. It's for those that are called by God and they hear his call. They just don't understand how to answer to the call. So you're there to be a confirmation. The Lord is using you as a vessel to confirm that God is calling and pulling them into the fold, into the um, into the um, as the sheep of God. So, you know, um, you know, if people don't want to listen, you got to leave them. You got to leave them to the enemy. Pray for them. And hey, you don't want to listen. I'm trying to warn you. You know, maybe because I one thing when you leave them to the enemy, this doesn't mean to let them die or anything. But when the devil put fire up under their tail, they'll start running to God then. That's just the last resort. Okay, you didn't want to go with my servants. I had my servants come. You didn't listen to my servant. I, uh, the, we had the elders of the church talk to you. You didn't want to listen to that. Now the enemy on your tail. Oh, whoa, I need God. Hell, I feel like the devil's trying to get me. Now you're talking to God. You, but at least you got to position and line yourself up with the Lord. We was just the we was just the warning before it got bad. So, you know, if you feel God is tugging at you, listen to that call because God is trying to save you from something because you're walking outside of his will. Amen. Let me get back into this. Um, it says, What sorrow awaits them that what sorrow awaits them for they Follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother, and ba 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 how you say this, Balaam, Balaam, by deceiving people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. This is, um, listen, listen, this is last resort stuff. 
When God is calling you and trying to save you, salute, salute. When God is calling you and trying to save you and you don't listen, this is what happens. You end up like Cain. Cain got mad because Abel gave God a better sacrifice than he did. So he got mad and killed. Thank you, Michaela. He got mad and killed his own brother because his brother gave um, a better sacrifice. You know, jealousy, mad, not listening, rebellion. <laughs> But anyways, so it says, when these people eat, Aramis, babe, can you come get them? Yeah. <sighs> anyways, uh, I'll be in the zone. If any little thing can pull me out, pray for me. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals con commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs. Watch this. They are like dangerous reefs. That can wreck, that can shipwreck you. Now, when I read that earlier, I said dangerous reefs and God showed me, okay, say you're in this boat. These dangerous reefs are very strong rock-like material that's underwater. You can't see it. And if you run into it, it'll tear the bottom of your boat. Okay, well, I'm not finna answer the phone. You're gonna have to wait. Hey, sheesh. Anyways, um, oh my gosh, the enemy do not want me talking about this. So many distractions coming left and right as I'm trying to get up out of here. They are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. Now, these dangerous reefs are. Strong rock-like material that is underwater. You can't see it. And if you're on a boat and you drive where reefs are, the bottom of your boat will rip open and sink. That's what these people are like. Basically, they're with you and around you. You think they're for you, but they're waiting to destroy you. These are the ones that are rebellious to God. That's why God tells us to come out from amongst them sinners and be ye separated. Some of us feel like God is calling me to be around the sinners. No. He's not calling you to sit up hanging around sinners. Man, okay, we can paintball. That's not important right now. He's talking about paintballing over the weekend. Anyways, um, but yeah, yeah. So basically he's saying these types that are around that do not receive the Lord, that are not rocking with Jesus, they're like dangerous reefs ready to shipwreck you. Here's another one it says it's like, it says, they are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. Now, a shameless shepherd is a person that are a shameless shepherd that only cares about himself, meaning he's a shepherd. So obviously there's some sheep, but the sheep he don't care about. He only cares about himself, leaving the sheep for dead, whatever. It's wolves all around him. He ain't trying to do nothing. If some wolves come on the scene, the shepherd is running in the house. In the sheep out there hoping the wolves don't eat all of them at least leave the male and the female not try to repopulate and make some more sheep he the shepherd's job is to run in front of the sheep and fight the wolf aramis oh my gosh the shepherd's job is to stand in front of the sheep and fight the wolves that's what jesus is for us jesus is not running away leaving us to the devil when we call on jesus he fights our battles and fights against the devil he does not run and hightail it and leave us out there to fight for ourselves that's why he says cast your cares on me for i care for you meaning when you get in trouble when you're in a jam when you're under attack go to jesus he is not going to leave you nor forsake you but he says being around these non-believer types these these um these people that don't want to um that don't want to receive the message that God has for them through you or anything of that nature. He says they are dangerous to you. How many of us been sitting up trying to get the same old four or five people saved? For the last 10 years, you've been trying to get them saved. You need to come on to church. You need to come. On. Hey, 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 just just live it. Go in there, and receive, get what God has for you. The Holy Spirit should be oozing out of you and drawing people. When I get around my friends, man, they know. 
man, man, keep doing what you're doing, man. One day I'm going to come up in. It's, they feel convicted. They might not say, I want Jesus right now and fall to the floor, ask for prayer. But there's a conviction that comes over them when they're around me. Like, man, man, I'm, man, I'm, man, just keep on praying for me, brother. I'm, I'm on my way, man. I'm trying to get it together. They, they, they feel it. They can feel the power of God on you. And it makes them like, ooh. Man, I got to get it together. I, I don't even feel like I'm supposed to be hanging around you. And you got to tell him, man, I'm just a human, man. I'm God is good. He loves you, man. It ain't, you know, just, just come to Jesus. God will give you that I'm, God you that opportunity to bring them to Christ in that moment. But sitting there fighting with them and arguing with them and telling them everything they doing wrong. And, you know, that ain't going to that, that get them. I got a story about that, too. But let me um, let me go.